Well, we are going to go ahead and dive in. Thank you all for being here. And thank you, especially to Ryan. Um, if you haven't already heard me say it tonight, the Investing Basics Workshop is one of my absolute favorite workshops Canvas offers. We are offering this as part of our Young Alumni Series. So our Young Alumni Series partners with Canvas on financial education throughout the year. We've done things like car buying, home buying, building a budget, we're doing investing. Um, we'll wrap up next month with holiday budgeting. It's deemed unwrapping a low stress holiday. I don't know about you all, but I could always use a little less stress um, around the holiday time. So certainly feel free to jump in. I will put the registration link in the chat here momentarily. I also wanna give a huge thanks to our CSU Alumni Association members. All of our membership or all of our programming at the Alumni Association is made possible by membership. Um, so if you are a member, huge thanks to you for allowing us to do this program and continue this program. Um, and then I just wanna make a quick note. I know some of you started in person, we moved virtual. We've had a little back and forth. So thank you for hanging in there with some of the COVID stuff. We will wrap out this season of the Young Alumni series virtually, but our hope is to be back in person and hybrid. So if you're loving the virtual stuff, don't worry, it's here to stay um, starting in the next year. At the end of tonight, I will also send out a survey. That's where you can tell us what topics you'd like to see. So if you'd like to see things like budgeting for your first baby um, or whatnot, pop that in the survey. All of our topics are based off of direct feedback from folks like you. So we would love, love, love any feedback you have to offer. Um, last couple of things I have to say before I'll turn it over to the more exciting part of this crew. You will remain muted and off of video the entire time. So if you have kids or dogs or whatnot crawling on you, rest assured you are all set. But we would love any participation, questions, all of that. My sole job tonight is to monitor the chat and chime in whenever there's questions. So if you type in the chat, you can either send to all attendees and panelists or all panelists. If you would like your question to remain anonymous, just send to all panelists. I will ask it, but I will never share your name. Ryan and I will see your question. Um, so it's not completely anonymous. I wanna be upfront about that, but no one else on the webinar tonight will know it came from you. If you wanna open it up to everyone, sometimes it's really fun and folks in the chat will answer each other's questions. So certainly invite you to do that as well. Um, but with that, you did not hear, come here tonight to hear me talk. So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Ryan. Ryan, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and let's go ahead and dive in. Yeah, thank you so much, Alexandra. My name is Ryan Muff. I'm with Canvas Advisors, and I'm a, a financial advisor that specializes in retirement planning. And um, before I get started, just want you guys to know that my compliance team really appreciates it if I stick to the script. So if you feel like I'm reading, you might be right. Um, but that's uh, on purpose. So uh, forgive me, I'll, I'll try to make it as uh, lively as possible, but um, uh, I do need to st stick to my script. So please interrupt me with questions um, because of course those answers are unscripted. Um, so welcome to Investment Basics. In this presentation, we're going to discuss the basics of investment planning. We'll start by discussing some fundamental investment concepts. Then we'll review some of the investment options that are available to you and consider some general investment strategies. Finally, we'll spend some time discussing how you might go about allocating your investment dollars. In the end, I hope that this overview will assist you in how to think about your own investment needs. So to begin, let me pose a question. What does investing mean to you? It's something different for everybody. I've heard um, some pretty wild thoughts, uh, like going to Las Vegas. Um, but I'm curious, just to give me some bookends. Taking care of your future self. That's a good one. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay, pay your, pay reti your retired self first. My first thought was making money without working. I, it takes a little bit of work, may not be right. The only way I can retire. 
That's a good one. Anyone else? You can do it anonymously as well. Passive income. Ultimately. Passive income. Yeah. Make yeah, and I've money been money hearing money. a lot more. What's that? Oh, sorry, I'm interrupting. I said, make your money work for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends. I, I have been hearing a lot more of um, the passive income uh, thing that that didn't use there. There didn't used to be very many people that would bring up passive income um, unless they were like 60. So it's interesting to hear young younger folks talking about that now. So some of you may associate investing with speculating gambling on the volatile or uncertain value of assets in the hope of obtaining potentially high returns, potentially high returns. For example, trying to time the market in order to make a quick profit. Others may see investing as more of a long-term methodical effort to save for the future. In fact, investing is a little bit of both. All investing involves a certain amount of risk, including the potential loss of principal, and there can be no ironclad guarantee that any investing strategy will be successful. Investing also involves the potential growth of your money over time. Consider investing a carefully planned and prepared approach to managing and accumulating money. Investing, investment planning is about discipline and patience, but it doesn't have to be difficult. An important concept to understand when it comes to investing is the impact of inflation. Inflation has the effect of reducing the purchasing power of your dollars over time. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, the average annual rate of inflation since 1914 has been approximately 3%, at 3% annual inflation. Something that costs $100 today would cost $181 in 20 years. So let's say you have $200,000 stashed in your mattress. Well, first, congratulations. And uh, assuming a 3% annual inflation rate, that $200,000 will buy you just over 108,000. There it goes. Sorry, there's a delay. 108,000 worth of goods and services in 20 years. And then 60,000 in purchasing power in 40 years. This means that if your investments aren't keeping pace with inflation, you're actually losing purchasing power every year. It also means that the real rate of return on your investments may actually be less than you think. This is something that you'll need to take into account, especially if you're saving for a long period of time as inflation is more, has more of an impact over a longer period of time. So inflation has the general effect of reducing the real value of your investments over time, but compounding has exactly the opposite effect. Anyone who has a savings account understands the basics of compounding. The funds in your savings account earn interest and that interest is added to your account balance. The next time interest is calculated, it's based on the increased value of your account. In effect, you earn interest on your interest. Many people, however, don't fully appreciate the impact that compounded earnings can have, especially over a long period of time. So let's say you invest $5,000 a year for 30 years. We're just making up numbers here. After 30 years, you will have invested a total of $150,000. Yet assuming your funds grow at exactly 6% each year because of compounding, after 30 years, you'll have over $395,000. One of the quick uh, ways to help you estimate how long it will take for an investment to double in value through compounding is called the rule of 72. You divide the number 72 by the rate at which the investment is expected to increase in value. The result is the number of years that it will take the investment to double. For example, if the expected annual return on an investment is 3%, it should take about 24 years for the investment to double in value. You can also use the rule of 72 to estimate the rate of interest you'd need to double your investment in a given number of years. You just divide 72 by the number of years. For example, in order for an investment to double in value in four years, you'd need an annual return of 18%. Pretty 
pretty hard to achieve. The sooner you start investing, the more time your investments have for potential growth. Waiting too long can make it very difficult to catch up. For example, invest 3,000 at the end of each year, starting when you're 20 years old, and you will have accumulated almost $680,000, assuming a 6% annual growth rate and no taxes um, prior to age 66. If you wait to begin that savings and you start investing 3,000 annually, you will accumulate, if you start at 35, um, you will accumulate $254,000. And if you wait until age 45 to start investing, you'll accumulate about $120,000 by the time you're 66 years old. It's never too, too late, so don't be discouraged. I'm simply trying to illustrate the importance and value of acting sooner rather than later. So Ryan, if you waited until later, say you're in that 35 benchmark and have the ability to invest more money, could you do that to catch up? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And that would, that's, you know, typically, um, I think, let's talk about uh, current, current students and recently graduated students. Many of the folks that I'm speaking to, um, they don't have a family yet. Uh, they're making more money than they have in the past. And so if they're able to cover their expenses, this is a great time for people to be putting as much money as they can into post-tax retirement accounts. Post-tax retirement accounts, not pre-tax retirement accounts, post-tax retirement accounts. Um, and I can explain a little bit more about that at the end. If there are questions. I was going to say, if there are questions, continue to pop them in the chat. We may dive into the post-tax and pre-tax retirement accounts. Um, and then a follow-up question that we often get is, say you did have like student loans, but we're making extra money. Is it better to invest that money or pay off like a student loan or a car loan faster? And that might be dependent on the situation, which is the answer we get a lot in this class, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, everybody's situation is a little bit different. It depends uh, a lot on the interest rate on the student loans. Um, it depends on the discretionary income. And it depends on, you know, whether or not you have any retirement savings already. Um, and to some extent, it, it depends on you. You know, um, some people you know, having enough retirement savings is, is very, very important to them. And they're perfectly happy paying more in interest um, as long as they're able to achieve their retirement goals. So um, it just kind of depends on what folks' priorities are and their individual situation. Yeah, it's a tricky one. It's one of those that I wish there was an easier roadmap for, but <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for diving into the questions. Yeah, my pleasure. The first step in any investment plan is to identify your goals. What are you investing for? The why you're investing. Uh, if you get, if you guys haven't seen it, Simon Sinek does a really good, uh, um, uh, what does he call it? Uh, something about why. It, that's not what it's titled. It has to do with why. Uh, check it out. Simon Sinek, why. You'll find it. Google's amazing. I was going to say, I can pop that in the chat, but before I let you get too far, <laughs> yeah, um, right. any thoughts on buying a house for living versus investing in like a retirement account since both are considered assets? Yeah, but they're, they're totally different kinds of assets. And, and if you don't necessarily have to choose, you can put uh, a lot of money into retirement accounts. And then when you're ready, pull that money out. Um, there is a, an exception to the 10% withdrawal penalty on IRAs and you can use for a first time home purchase. So if you're thinking, you know, maybe you won't have to buy a house or you're rocking van life at the moment, um, you know, I would say cram money into the retirement accounts. And then if you need to pull some of that out, you can just keep in mind, uh, you know, um, are you putting money in pre-tax or post-tax? Because if you pull money out from a pre-tax account to buy a house, you'll have to pay taxes on that. So 
Um, there are there are considerations, but uh, yeah, a, a home, you know, renting is not the best if you're going to be in one place for a long time. So it, once you're ready to settle down in one theoretically in one city, um, I would encourage home. It, trying to purchase a home, saving and uh, looking into it. Um, both uh, a, a house is, is not just, it can be both an investment and uh, a home at the same time. Many of ours are, and that's one of the best ways to build wealth. Uh, at the same time, um, average rate of returns out of the S&P 500 since 19. 19- 40 or, or, you know, 7%. So um, ideally, we would do both if we can. Again, that's situational. Great question, though. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't plug that we did a home buying workshop a couple of weeks ago. I'm actually going to put in the chat a link to all of the Canvas sponsored series. Um, so if that's of interest and you want to dive more down the rabbit hole of home buying, definitely check that one out as well. Um, but thanks, Ryan. I think we're caught up on questions for now, but definitely keep them coming in the chat and I will jump back in. Many of us invest to accumulate funds for retirement or a child's education. Others invest for shorter term goals, perhaps a down payment on a home or a new car. Still others invest to build a fund that they can access for unanticipated financial needs like illness, accident, or job loss. Of course, you may have all these things as investment goals or something that I haven't mentioned. If you do have multiple goals, make sure you consider how you might prioritize them. Well, once you've identified and prioritized your investment goals, consider the time horizon associated with each goal. Generally speaking, all else being equal, the longer your time horizon, the more aggressively you may be willing to invest. Some investments carry more risk because they offer a greater potential for return. And they will tend to be more appropriate for those with long-term investment horizons compared to those with short-term investment horizons. The reason is that the longer the investment horizon, the more time you'll have to recover from any investment losses. The world of investing is very subjective. (laughs) <laughs> as we've seen. The investment plan that's right for you depends largely upon the level of comfort that you have when it comes to risk. You can't completely avoid risk when it comes to investing, but it is possible for you to manage it. There are two aspects of risk tolerance to consider. First, the capacity of your investment plan itself to absorb losses. And second, how comfortable you are <clears throat> personally with risk. The first aspect can be quantified. The more flexibility your investment plan has when it comes to potential loss, the more risk your plan can tolerate. For example, as we've discussed, a long investment time horizon may allow you to take on more risk than a short time horizon. The second aspect, how comfortable you are personally with risk, is more of an emotional measure and depends on many factors, including your objectives, life stage, personality, investment experience, and understanding of investments. Some investors are comfortable with a high degree of risk, while others can tolerate only minimal risk. Your individual risk tolerance is an important factor in deciding which individual investments are appropriate for you, as well as how your investment dollars should be allocated among different investment classes. Investors are typically grouped into three categories for purposes of discussing risk tolerance. Aggressive, those with a high degree of risk tolerance, moderate, those with a willing to accept some degree of risk, and conservative, those who are risk averse. So there's a direct relationship between risk and return. In general, as the potential for return increases, so does the level of risk. Or stated another way, the less risk an investment has, the lower the potential for return. So for example, putting your money into a bank CD may have little risk, but it also offers less potential return than purchasing common stock. This is true for investment portfolios as well as for individual investments. The more aggressive you are as an investor, 
the more risk you may be willing to take. More risk means greater potential return, but also a greater chance of loss. Conversely, the more conservative you are as an investor, the less risk you're generally comfortable with. Less risk means lower potential returns, but less likelihood of loss as well. This is known as the risk return trade-off. As much as we would like it, we can't have it all. There's a relationship between growth, income, and the stability of our investments. And when we move closer to one, we automatically move away from another. This is the dilemma that all investors face. And the key is to try to maximize returns at a level of risk that you're comfortable with and will help you achieve and is most likely to help you achieve your goals. This is a fun question. What advice, like what should someone look for in a financial advisor? And it might tie into their willingness to take risks, but um, your thoughts on that one? Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a really hard question because, um, it's, that's a long list. Um, you, you want, ideally you want an advisor, um, first and foremost that you trust. Now, trust isn't something that comes lightly for most folks. Um, so, you know, doing your research and then meeting with a, a variety of advisors, um, and trust your gut. You'll know whether or not you're you're witnessing a sales presentation or an actual conversation. Um, so your comfort level with the advisor, whether or not you think you're going to be able to trust them, because that's a big component of a relationship with a financial advisor. Um, additionally, you want to make sure that how they do things is consistent with um, your personality. You want to you want to make sure that you're going to be a good fit. Um, I'm not a good fit for everybody and <clears throat> everybody's not a good fit for me. So you, you just want to make sure that, um, the type of advisor that, that you think you might be working with for a long time, uh, provides not only the, the, the right services, um, but has the right experience and knowledge and then packages that in a way that, that is useful to you as an individual. Um, I think those are the those are the two big ones. Um, you know, otherwise you're looking at like CFP or chartered financial consultant credentials. Uh, and in the scheme of things, I've found that um, uh, nothing will protect you as much as your own intuition, because um, there's there's all kinds of different folks out there. I love that. Sounds like life advice all around, not just a financial <laughs> advisor. I think um, in a past workshop you did for us too, you had made a comment that asking friends for recommendations is always a nice starting point too. I find with a lot of the financial stuff, if you have friends using like financial advisors or realtors or whatnot, um, you obviously trust your friends. So or hopefully trust your friends. Um, and if you don't, maybe you're one of the more risky advising types anyways. Um, but that was a great question. Thank you for that. And then our next one, we're going to switch topics a little bit, but will you talk about the difference between preferred and common stocks? Um, yeah, and I think I get, I'm going to get into that here shortly. Um, but well, actually, I don't think we get into the difference between preferred and common specifically. Um, the answer uh, for more information on any of this sort of stuff, Investopedia is a great resource, um, like Encyclopedia, but Investopedia. Um, preferred stock, uh, it essentially just moves you up the, um, the bankruptcy chain. So if a company goes bankrupt, if you have preferred stock, you're more likely to get some of your money back than you are if you have common stock. Um, there are some other benefits depending on the type of preferred stock that can come with preferred stock, um, but they do they do vary. Um, the bankruptcy chain is is the most important difference. Perfect. And I did pop that Investopedia into the chat for folks who want to take a look at it. 
Um, and then the last question we have, if a person has no debt, what percentage of one's salary should you generally invest and what percentage should you generally keep liquid as cash? Um, I would think of that a different way. Uh, or I would encourage you to think about it a different way. Um, I would encourage you to keep, uh, depending on your job, six to nine, maybe even 12 months if you're in a sales position uh, and your income fluctuates, um, you know, maybe you might be looking at 12 months worth of expenses in cash. Um, otherwise, you know, any, any discretionary um, income once your emergency account is full, right? You've got that six to 12 months worth of cash. <clears throat> you're paying all your bills. Uh, you're not behind on anything. You don't have any big credit card bills. Um, then a substantial uh, portion of your income can be invested. Um, just make sure that you have all the other boxes checked. If you're paying down student loans, you know, you pay double on those if you can and still invest, that's great um, because you always have to subtract your uh, interest rate on your loans from the rate of return that you think you'll get out of the stock market. Um, so that's your real rate of return for, for those assets. So um, yeah, that's, that's a good opportunity. If you're in that kind of a situation and you're young, um, you're looking at compound interest for over you know, 30 or 40 years. And that goes a long way, even on a little bit of money. Awesome. These are really, really great questions, y'all. Please do keep them coming. I think we're caught up on all of the questions we had for now. If I did miss any, um, feel free to just reflag it for me, but I'll let you keep going, Ryan. We're trekking right along. So there are several categories of investments to choose from and countless specific investment options within each category. First, there's cash alternatives, bonds, stocks, other investments, and funds that pool your money with that of other investors, like mutual funds or exchange traded funds. Before we start talking about specific investment options, let's take a moment to clear up a common misconception. Some folks think that your 401k plan at work is an investment, but it's not. A 401k plan, excuse me, is actually a tax advantaged vehicle that holds individual investments. The same goes for IRAs, 529 plans, and Coverdell uh, educational savings accounts. Think of these as tax advantaged vehicles um, or, or buckets that can be filled with individual investments. Investments that are held in these vehicles get tax, get different tax treatment than investments that are held in other vehicles like non-qualified or retail accounts. We're not gonna discuss the tax treatment of investments at all today. However, it is an important subject, especially since the tax treatment of long-term capital gains and qualifying dividends is typically more favorable than that for, any, for ordinary income. <clears throat> since you'll need to understand how different investment options are taxed to make good decisions today, you should discuss this issue with a financial or tax professional. So cash alternatives are relatively low risk, short term and generally fairly liquid. In other words, you can convert them to cash quickly if needed. You might use cash alternatives to provide you with relatively relative stability, to maintain a ready source of cash for emergencies or other purposes, or serve as a temporary parking place for assets until you decide where to put money longer term. A few examples of, of some cash alternatives include CDs, money market deposit accounts, mutual fund, money market mutual funds, and US Treasury bills or T bills. Each option differs, each option offers different rates of return and varying levels of liquidity. Also, some cash alternatives such as bank CDs and deposit accounts may offer FDIC or NCUA insurance. Others do not. Be sure you understand the type of protection available with each one. Bonds are essentially loans, which is why they're called debt instruments. You, the investor, lend money to a government or a corporation. 
The interest rate or coupon rate, which can be fixed or floating, is set in advance, and interest payments are generally paid semi-annually. Bonds are issued in denominations as low as $1,000. And in addition to a set interest rate, the maturity date is fixed, ranging from one to 30 years, typically. However, bonds don't need to be held until they mature. Once issued, they can be traded among investors like any other type of security. Because you can buy or sell bonds on the secondary market, bonds fluctuate in price, selling at, above, or below their face value. If interest rates rise, new bonds and investment options are offered with higher interest rates, and existing bonds with lower interest rates become less appealing. So when interest rates rise, existing bonds generally decrease in value. In contrast, when interest rates fall, existing bonds generally increase in value. Generally speaking, the longer a bond's duration to maturity, the more volatile its price swings will be based on interest rates. When you buy a company stock, you're actually purchasing a share of ownership in that business. The greater the number of shares you own, the higher the percentage of ownership you have in that company. Investors who purchase stock are known as the company's stockholders or shareholders. Your percentage of ownership in a company that also represents your share, I'm sorry, your percentage of ownership in a company also represents your share of the risks taken and profits generated by the company. If the company does well, your share of the total earnings will be proportionate to how much of the company's stock you own. The flip side, of course, is that your share of any loss will be similarly proportionate to your percentage of ownership, though you're not personally financially responsible for any share of the liabilities of the company in which you hold an equity interest. Beyond that, depending on the company and the types of shares you have, Stock ownership may carry other benefits. Specifically, you may be entitled to dividend payments, which you can generally receive either in cash or additional shares, capital gains payouts, and other corporate privileges. For example, example common stockholders have the right to vote for candidates for the board of directors and on other important issues. The same is true of preferred stock. If you purchase stock, you can make money in one of two ways. First, corporate earnings may be distributed in the form of dividends, usually paid quarterly. Secondly, you can sell your shares. If the value of the company's stock has increased since you purchased it, you'll make a profit. The flip side is that if the value of that stock has declined, you'll lose money. I think we're still. Uh... Still rocking and rolling. Cash alternatives, bonds, and stock are the three major investment categories, but there are many other options, including real estate, uh, both commercial and residential, um, stock options, futures, and commodities, uh, which amount to some extent to speculating on the future value of, of gold or sugar or wheat, and then collectibles like uh, antiques, fine art, or anything that may appreciate in value over the years. Because this is an investment basics discussion, we're not going to spend much time on these other investments, but I'll be happy to discuss them to some extent if you like. Mutual funds represent another way to invest in stocks, bonds, or cash alternatives. The principle behind a mutual fund is simple. Your money is pooled along with the money of other investors into a fund, which then invests in certain securities according to a stated investment strategy. And the fund is managed by a fund manager who reports to a board of directors. By investing in the fund, you own, a, you own a piece of the total portfolio, which could include anywhere from a few dozen to hundreds of, of, of stocks or bonds, securities. This provides you with both a convenient way to obtain professional money management and instant diversification that would be more difficult and expensive to achieve on your own. <coughs> 
Every mutual fund publishes a prospectus. Before investing in a mutual fund, get a copy and carefully review the information it contains as best you can, such as the fund's investment objective, risks, fees, and expenses. Carefully consider those factors as well as others before investing. So we've discussed the three major cat investment categories, cash alternatives, bonds, and stocks. Mutual funds limit themselves to just one of these categories in some cases. Commonly named and classified according to their investment style or objective, funds that invest solely in cash alternatives are generally called money market funds. Funds that invest solely in bonds are called bond funds and not surprisingly, funds that invest in stocks are called stock funds. Stock mutual funds can also be classified based on the size of the companies in which the fund invests, like large cap, mid cap, and small cap, where capitalization stands, where cap stands for capitalization. So a large cap or capitalization company is companies that you've heard of. Uh, small cap companies are, are companies that have, uh, I think it's $25 million in, in value. So those are typically companies that we haven't heard much about. Of course, there are many other types of mutual funds. For example, funds that invest in both bonds and stocks are often called balanced funds. In fact, there are mutual funds that fit all along the risk return spectrum. International funds, which seek investment opportunities outside the United States, are one example. An actively managed fund is one where the fund manager uses their knowledge and research to actively buy and sell securities in an attempt to beat a benchmark. A passively managed account, called an index fund, typically buys and holds most or all of the securities represented in a specific index, like the S&P 500 index. The objective of an index fund is to obtain the same rate of return as the index it mimics. Although the name of a mutual fund sometimes offers insight into its investment style and objective, please don't rely on the name alone to determine whether a particular fund is what you want. You should read a fund's prospectus before you consider investing. Like a mutual fund, an exchange-traded fund pools your money with the money of other investors and invests in a collection of securities. However, there are some key differences you need to understand. Unlike actively managed mutual funds, exchange-traded funds typically select investments according to a specific index, like the S&P 500. The fund's investment choices typically don't change unless the index itself changes. That passive management style and relatively infrequent trading can help reduce the fund's costs for such things as management fees, research into individual securities, and trading fees for buying and selling. In this way, they're a bit like an index mutual fund. <clears throat> Even if ETFs have a passive management style, they can be useful to investors who want to trade actively. For example, an ETF can be traded throughout the day and its price may fluctuate as a result of that activity, just, to, just like a stock. This is different from a mutual fund, which is priced only once a day after the market closes. Also, an ETF can be bought on margin, sold short, or traded using stop orders or limit orders, just as a stock can. And ETFs are one way to invest in an individual market segment or industry without limiting yourself to a single stock or bond. So again, with ETFs, you can get that instant diversification. And finally, because they trade relatively infrequently, ETFs may offer tax efficiencies. For example, they may make lower taxable annual distributions to shareholders. Like a mutual fund, each ETF publishes a prospectus. Get a copy before investing and carefully review the information it contains. Even if two ETFs in the invest in the same market segment, they may use indexes that are structured slightly differently. As with a mutual fund before investing in an ETF, get a copy of the prospectus available from the fund and carefully review the information it contains, such as the fund's investment objectives, risks, fees, and expenses. 
carefully consider those factors as well as others before investing. Now on to strategies. Many investor, investors utilize an investment strategy called dollar cost averaging. With dollar cost averaging, rather than investing a single lump sum, you invest smaller amounts of money at regular intervals, no matter how the market is performing. Your goal is to reduce the overall volatility of your portfolio by purchasing more shares when the price is low and fewer shares when the price is high. Although dollar cost averaging can't guarantee you a profit or avoid a loss, a regular fixed dollar investment may result in a lower average price per share over time, assuming you continue to invest through all types of markets, types of markets being up markets, down markets, sideways markets. You should consider your financial <clears throat> ability to make ongoing purchases regardless of price fluctuations. For example, let's say you decide to invest $300 a month towards your child's college education. Because you invest the same amount each month, you will automatically buy more shares when prices are low and fewer shares when prices are high. Over time, you'll find that your average cost per share is actually less than the average market price per share over the time that you invested. If you're currently contributing automatically to a 401k plan at work, congratulations, you're already practicing dollar cost averaging. So asset allocation. It's an almost universally accepted, almost universally accepted concept that any portfolio should include a mix of investments. That is a portfolio should contain investments with varying levels of risk to help minimize exposure. Many investors make the mistake of putting all their eggs in one basket. For example, if you invest in one stock and that stock goes through the roof, a fortune can be made. On the other hand, the stock can lose all of its value resulting in a total loss of your investment. That's a bummer. Diversifying your investment over several asset classes will help reduce your risk of losing your entire investment. Keep in mind, though, that diversification cannot ensure a profit or guarantee against a loss. Asset allocation is one of the first steps in creating a diversified investment portfolio. Asset allocation is the concept of deciding how your investment dollars should be allocated among broad investment classes, such as stocks, bonds, and cash equivalents. The underlying principle is that different asset classes of investments have shown different rates of return and levels of price volatility over time. Also, since different asset classes respond differently to the same news, your stocks may go down while your bonds go up or vice versa. Diversifying your investments over different asset classes may help you lower the overall volatility <clears throat> of your portfolio. So how do you choose the mix that's right for you? A number of resources are available, including interactive tools and sample allocation models. Most of these take a number of variables, some objective, like your age or financial resources available, time frames, time horizon, and your need for liquidity. Others are subjective, your tolerance for risk, your outlook on the economy, and then they suggest a possible allocation mix. You'll want to choose a mix of investments that has the potential to provide the return that you want at the level of risk you feel comfortable with. For that reason, it often makes sense to work with a financial professional to gauge your risk tolerance, then tailor a portfolio to your risk profile and financial situation. Every individual situation is unique. Nevertheless, in general, conservative asset allocation models will invest heavily in bonds and cash alternatives with a primary goal of preserving principle. In comparison, a moderate asset allocation model will attempt to balance income and growth by allocating significant investment dollars to both stocks and bonds. And finally, an aggressive asset allocation model will tend to concentrate heavily in stocks, focusing on potential growth. 
And as you've seen, there's a lot to consider when it comes to investing. If you don't have the time, confidence, or inclination to put together an investment plan, you might benefit from the help and advice of a financial professional. A professional can help you determine your investment goals, timelines, and risk tolerance. That's important. Evaluate, evaluate markets and investments, create an asset allocation model, select specific investments, manage and monitor your portfolio, and modify your portfolio when necessary. Small steps can enhance your financial life one day at a time. All questions are welcome. And finally, the best part, the disclaimer. Woo! Thank you, Ryan. That was a lot of information and I know a lot to sit on. And when we talk about financial stuff, um, so much of it is individualized. Are you a risk taker? Are you not a risk taker? Would you rather buy a house or invest or hopefully both? And if you are doing both or one or the other or neither, share those wins and stories with the CSU Alumni Association as they happen. Um, I know no one else can see you, but um, we're just going to do a pretend round of applause. And please do continue to pop your questions in the chat. We had some really, really good questions early on. Um, I know we really busted through some of that information quite quickly, and there is a lot to digest. We will send out a recording and slides in the next couple of days. And if other questions pop up, certainly feel free to respond to those and we can answer them retrospectively. Um, we won't steal more of your time than necessary tonight, but I am going to go ahead and pop a survey in the chat. As I mentioned at the beginning, we pick our topics based off of direct feedback from you all. Um, let me pop that in the chat to everyone. So if you are like I am gunning to see home buying or car buying or budgeting, whatever it may be, certainly please let us know via the survey. Um, it is how we will plan which Young Alumni Series workshops we offer next year, um, which is really, really great. We do have a couple of questions, so I'm just going to dive in and certainly feel free to keep them coming. But this one says, market might come down in three to six years. Best place to keep 30% down payment until then. First off, congrats on having 30% down payment to keep. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so I assume you're, uh, you're speaking to the housing market, uh, expecting that to come down in three to six years. Um, if that's the assumption, um, that's tough. That's really hard. I mean, right now, interest rates, we're in a low interest rate environment. Um, it's hard to find any place that, that has safe money um that has safe options for your money um you know bonds if you're going to use bonds i would encourage you to only use like a, a very short duration uh bond fund or if you're picking your own bonds don't do anything more than six or 12 months um because interest rates are going to start going up probably not in the next year, but but not too far out. Uh, and of course, as I explained, interest rates have uh, an inverse relationship to bond values. And the longer the duration of the bonds, the more the impact of those interest rate changes. So, you know, um, largely, yeah, it's, you're in a, everybody's in a tight spot. Um, I talk to people on a daily basis that are looking for a better rate of return with not a lot of risk. And in a low interest rate environment, that's a challenge. I do have options available, but uh, there's certainly, um, I'm not sure. Feel free to reach out to me and I'll, I'll teach you about, you know, things that are available out there like market linked CDs, but those, you know, in three to six years, that's tough. You're in a tough spot. Good luck. <laughs> it's a, I, the financial workshops are tricky and that I feel like half the time we're like, it's such a situation dependent. Good luck. 
Um, but we'll certainly share contact information, assuming that's all good, um, and do reach yeah, out and use those resources as you can. Yeah. Um, this question, uh, I might take, Ryan, unless you have an easy answer. Do you know if CSU offers financial advising to graduate students? I don't know that we specifically work with financial advisors. We do have a Canvas branch in the Lori Student Center. Um, that is, that's a very, very good question. Um, I can, I can pick up where you left off. Yeah, go for it. You'll probably have a better answer. No, no. I mean, that's one of the reasons for the partnership between Canvas and CSU. Um, it's uh, we've got Canvas has two advisors up north that, that help out in the, the CSU area, Fort Collins. Um, and uh, yeah, please feel free to reach out to us if you know you have any questions. Uh, we work with all different types of uh, folks, and so we're we're. We're well versed in all of this space. And I'm putting my email address in the chat right now. I was going to say, what a time of life to be in need of a financial advisor. I know I wish I had been more diligent in my grad school days. So Ryan just popped his email into the chat, or I, I did, Ryan did, both of us did. Mm. Um, I don't see any other questions, so we'll hang out for another minute or two if you have more questions, but if not, we will give you a little bit of time back today. We'll get the slides out here soon, um, and I want to say thank you all for sharing your time. Thank you again, Ryan, and go Rams. I did see someone ask for the video again, so I will pop that in the chat too. Um, the Simon Sinek video, it's it's a good one. I would recommend watching it. And I just have to scroll up a minute until I can. Did you, so did you find the link, Alexander? I did. Awesome. I did. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. What's it called? It the is power called, of the you're gonna all hear the video, a quick way to find your why. A quick way to find your why? Oh. Not it. Am mm. I sending the wrong video out? It's not, you can't go wrong with Simon Sinek. All of his stuff is good. I want to say it was the power of why. Power of why. But that, I'm, I, there's yeah. a start with why. Start with why. That's start the Start with why. That's Thank you to who asked that question, because now you get lots of Simon Sinek videos. Um, start with why. Yeah, I, don't, I do not. Uh, Simon Sinek and I don't know each other. Um, and then Ryan, last question, and this is, well, it may or may not be the last, but last one for now, and it's an easy one. Are mm -hmm. we okay with sharing the slides? I have to ask Ryan, because they're his hard work. Um, uh, they are, uh, yes, they are approved for distribution to the public. Perfect. We will get those shared as well. The financial slides, we just always check on, because financial stuff changes so quickly. So. We'll share them alongside the recording with the caveat that the world is a funny place and they're an educational piece and don't hold on to it as if you're <laughs> stuck on it because we never know what'll change, but we will get those sent out in the next couple of days. Perfect. Well, thank you all again. Have a wonderful, wonderful night. A um, couple more questions rolling in. So yeah. who can we call to start investing? Any bank, any financial advisor? How would you, if you're like, I want to start investing, but don't know where to turn. Call, call me, just shoot me an email. Um, I'll, and, and here's the thing. I, I typically encourage people to work with folks uh, in their region, like that are close by, right? So that you can go meet them in person. Um, so, you know, I can, I can help kind of, give you some, some details on what you should be looking for, for in terms of financial advisors. I might even be able to point you in the right direction of a, of a good advisor in your area. Um, but if, if you're in the Fort Collins or Loveland or, you know, Thornton, North Denver, um, reach out to me and um, I can at least, you know, verify the information that you're getting if you, if you talk to another advisor. 
And if you are not in the I-25 corridor, so Fort Collins, Denver, Colorado Springs, and you would be more comfortable reaching out to the Alumni Association. Certainly Ryan is the expert here, but we can try to connect you with folks um, nationally if you're not one of our I-25 corridor friends. And I mean, Canvas has, so the Canvas Advisor Program uh, serves all of the Canvas branches. So if there's a Canvas branch close to you, there is a financial advisor that serves that branch and will help however they can. Perfect. Um, what about this is a fun question. So what to look for when investing in stocks? Big topic. So maybe a uh, or some material. Let's say somebody's never invested in stocks and they're like, what's one piece of advice you would give them? Uh, what's your goal? What's your main goal? Because stocks are like this. Stocks are, you know, um, there's there's something out there for everybody. Uh, like, you know, you could in, you can invest in ESG companies, uh, in, in uh, environmental, social governance, you know, companies that that focus on that sort of stuff. You can invest in, you know, clean energy. They they have clean energy ETFs that that invest in like the world is your oyster. And I think that's one of the um, really meaningful reasons to get a financial advisor is they'll help you decipher some of that and work through some of that and um, whatnot as yeah. well. And if you're doing, if you're starting out and you're doing it yourself, I would, uh, you know, consider um, the price of the stock. Uh, I'm making the assumption that you might, um, you might um, consider the you know how much you have to invest right if you're if you just want to buy tesla stock and you've got five thousand dollars to invest you can buy like three and a half shares um and you can't buy fractional shares so watching the the price of the stock in relation to the amount that you have to invest that's a that's a big deal um in terms of you know ratios like the price to PE ratio, uh, for, that stands for price to earnings ratio. Um, there's a ton of ratios out there. Um, Investopedia is going to be your best resource uh, for, you know, if you're, if you're looking to pick stocks, um, Investopedia will be really good. There are, there are services out there where you pay and they give you their, their top stock pick of the day or the week or, or whatever. Um, so there are those sorts of things that can probably help you in the right direction. Additionally, before you get started, um, I would encourage you to, to open up a TD Ameritrade account. And um, I, don't, uh, I, I don't work for TD Ameritrade, um, but they offer a program called Think or Swim. Think or Swim gives you the ability to, to trade fictional money. And kind of see how you do. Uh, if you're if you're going to run your own account, I'd encourage you to do that before you actually really start getting heavily invested. Otherwise, I would encourage you to to buy and hold. Pick stocks that you think are going to do well over a long period of time, and then hang on to them. Um, that's your your probably. Yeah, that's always good advice. Great question. This is another tricky one, and I don't know how you're going to want to weigh in on it, but if they're looking to move out of the country within a couple of years, should they still invest? And should they invest in this country or where they move? Um, well, you may not be able to invest in the country that you're going to move to because you probably have to be in that country in order to, to set up those investments. So I would encourage if you want to invest, um, invest here um, and do so moderately, not more aggressively, not more risky than moderate. Um, you don't wanna to take too much at three years. That's not a, that's not a long time period. Um, so I, I wouldn't want you to take too much risk knowing that you know once you're out of the country you can't really place trades 
on your account. So if you if you if you live here, you open up your account here, and then you move to Sweden, then you can't call your your broker or your financial advisor and say, "Hey, I, I want to um, I want to you know move some money around." Uh, they can't do that for you. You have to be in the country to to place trades. So the big consideration is that in a couple of years you'll likely be cashing out of all your positions and taking that money with you, um, transferring it to, to the next country you're gonna be in and then investing it there. Such a tricky one. Um, yeah. But that's really neat that you are moving as well. Keep us updated on your adventure and all the good travel stories too. Maybe we'll get a fun alumni article out of it or something. How about, is it worth investing if your regular savings account is pretty low and you don't make much money? So uh, it depends on how much discretionary income you have. Um, it's, it's like this, like uh, you could, you could have, um, you know, a relatively low savings account. Uh, you don't make a lot of money, but you don't spend hardly any money because you're a grad student maybe. And like, you just are <laughs> spend, you know, 16, 20 hours a day, like, you know, doing your grad student stuff or your, you know, maybe you just work a long, long hours. Um, and so if you're, if your expenses are low, um, you know, as long as you've got that emergency account, I would say it's always worth investing, especially if you're young, uh, putting a hundred dollars a month in or $50 a month, um, you know, still over time that will turn into, to more money. And at the end of the day, you're always fighting inflation. So you have you, it, it really helps to balance out your emergency account with some kind of an investment account. Otherwise, if all your money is is you know essentially in the bank or the credit union, then uh, based on current interest rates, you're just going backwards. So you got to have something that's growing faster than three percent to offset the the two percent loss that you're getting on your money in in your your bank and your your financial institution does that make does that make any kind of sense alexandra it made sense to me and i think too one of the things um i think about investing too is even if you're not making a ton of money or you're just putting fifty dollars a month in whatever it may be it's a nice habit to train yourself into um so that when you get older and are making more money or have more um, income to put towards investing, you're already in that habit of, I got my paycheck, this needs to go to the investing account. Yeah. And setting it up so that it happens every month, um, doing small amounts, you, you just don't really notice them not being there. Um, right. You notice what ends up in your checking account or your savings account. Um, so I think that, I think that, you know, just doing something, anything, if you're young, I would strongly encourage a, a Roth IRA. Um, I would likely strongly encourage a Roth IRA to anybody that wants to save for retirement. Uh, but especially if you're young, because you've just got so much time for that to double repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Good question. Really, really good questions tonight. I think we're for real winding down, but I, every time I say, I think we're winding down, y'all surprise me. Um, so again, one more huge thanks to Ryan and to you all. Um, and surprise, surprise, another question. Um, so what would, a couple of questions on, you're gonna dive into uh, Roth IRAs now, Ryan. Will you yep. talk about what would double and then, um, this note says, I thought IRAs didn't keep up with inflation. Mm, okay. Uh, what would double? Um, what would double would be the amount that you invest, right? Like, so uh, using some of our, our earlier examples, um, no, let's use a, 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 a simpler example. Let's say you put $100 a month into a uh, retirement account. Well, over the course of 
you know, 10 years, you will have put in $12,000. Well, every 10 years, theoretically, statistically going backwards, the S&P S and P 500 returns about 7% per year. Um, so that, that should mean using the rule of 72, that, that $12,000 that we put in, it took us 10 years to get there. So some of that money has grown throughout those 10 years, but let's just keep things easy and say, okay, 10 years go by, we've invested 12,000, um, over the next 10 years, that money's going to double. Probably if we're invested in, in, you know, a, aggressive funds, that money should double. Well, the first doubling, you know, um, that's nice. 12,000 turns into 24,000, but the next time it doubles, well, that turns into 48,000. And if you started doing this when you were 20, you can let it double again. And that 48 becomes 96,000, right? So now we're talking about like real money. And all we did, we just invested $12,000 over the, over 30 years. Yeah. It took 30 years for it to double three times, but it did. And typically it will. So anything you can get in, you know, that just gives it more time to double and double and double and keep, just keep on doubling. Um, that's just my, that's the way I like to think about uh, the value of investing when you're young. Um, it's just compound, compound interest. IRAs. So an IRA is an investment vehicle, right? An IRA is not an investment. A 401k is not an investment. It's an investment vehicle that we take investments and we put them into, right? A, a traditional IRA, think of it as um, your uh, GMC Savannah, all right? And then your Roth IRA, that's your Ford Raptor. I'm, I'll explain why in a second. And then, uh, you know, you've got like a retail investment account. You can have the same investments in all three of those accounts. And you can, you can, you know, move investments around inside of those accounts, but it's not the account that determines your rate of return. It's the investments inside of those accounts. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. So, so an IRA, a Roth IRA, a traditional IRA, it will keep pace with inflation. It will beat inflation or it will, it will uh, not beat inflation depending on how it's invested, right? If you invest your Roth IRA in a money market, a, a, a money market mutual fund, yeah, it's not gonna keep pace with inflation. And we're getting you, uh, yeses in the chat. So thank you all for confirming too. Please do feel free to just jump in if we're not making sense up here. Cool, thank um, you. We have about 15 more minutes, so we'll keep plugging away. But if you have burning questions, let us know. This is an interesting one. It's if we could invest 50% of our income per year, is that a bad financial decision? And then as a follow-up, I'll let you start there and then I'll give you the follow-up. Uh, and, and I am, I did open up chats, um, okay. but I, I am following them to some extent. Um, if you could invest 50% of your income a year, <clears throat> Assuming you have everything else taken care of, not at all. Um, however, why, 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 right, Simon? Why, what are you investing for? Do you want to retire early? Do you want to create income? Um, there's a whole uh, FIRE culture, financial independence, retire early. Um, and, uh, as far as I can tell, I'm working with a couple of these individuals and they're following it's, it's basically just like a giant Reddit chat. Um, so check that out. If you're into red, if you're into that, I'm, I'm not on Reddit. Um, but I have found that, uh, most of these fire individuals that this, it, you would, you would fit in that category. If you can invest 50% of your income every year. Um, you know, they're, they are not, uh, typically working with professionals and that is costing them a lot of opportunity and a lot of tax dollars. Um, but of course I'm not part of, of that scene. And so it's a little bit hard to have any kind of an effect, but I would say, um, uh, reach out to me so that I can point you in the right direction, if nothing else. Um, and the follow-up question 
Uh, and just, um, I'm gonna pause real quick because no one else can see the follow-up question but us. So if you are listening to the answer, the follow-up question is, should we put more money in the company IRA? Um, sorry, I lost it. Or investment portfolios with our advisor. So that's what Ryan's about to answer. Thank you, yeah, yeah. So um, that depends. <laughs> Uh, and and here's here are the here are the things that you have to weigh. One, um, you have to weigh the costs of the investments with your advisor, uh, with against the difference in performance. So if the costs with your advisor are not paying hot more interest than the four hundred one k your company IRA then the company IRA is likely a better place. Um, that being said, depending on how you're invested with your advisor, there may be other considerations. Like your 401k, that's entirely managed by you. So, um, you know, it changes are only made to that when you log in and make changes. Depending on what kind of investment strategy you've employed with your financial advisor, that could be managed for risk or to get a certain rate of return, not just kind of uh, 30% large cap, 50% mid cap, right? Like, like there, there's likely more strategy behind the portfolio with your financial advisor, at least I hope so. If that doesn't seem like that's the case, then probably the 401k is a better way to go. And then, um... wait, let me let me wait. Hold on, but make sure that you uh, investigate whether your your 401k has pre-tax and post-tax savings options for retirement. Roth versus traditional, pre-tax versus post-tax. That's that's going to be that can have a huge impact on on retirement planning. And I think I understand this question. Well, let's go with um, so invest in pre-tax, not post-tax. Since you just touched on that. Uh, um, well, if you're young. I'm gonna make the assumption that, that everybody on here is under the age of 30, is that fair? We don't know folks age, but we do advertise it as the Young Alumni Series. Um, so we target around that age demographic. So I, I would say, here's the thing, a Roth IRA has um, tax-free growth. You put, with a Roth, with a Roth IRA, I got gotcha. you. With a Roth IRA, um, you're investing after you pay the taxes on that income. So let's let's say you make twenty thousand dollars and you put uh, five thousand dollars into your Roth IRA. Well, that five you still have to pay taxes on the twenty thousand that you make in twenty twenty one. But the five thousand dollars that you put in your Roth IRA, um, that grows tax free. So that when you get to 59 and a half, you can take all that money out without paying any taxes on it. Pre-tax dollars, you don't pay, you, you make 20,000, you put 5,000 into your traditional IRA or your pre-tax 401k. That money, um, you only pay taxes on 15,000. You made 20, you put five into your, your retirement account, your pre-tax retirement account. That means you only pay taxes on 15. But at 20, if you're earning $20,000 a year, you're in the 12% tax bracket. Only, only 10,000 is you're paying 12% taxes on. The, the first 10,000, you're not paying any taxes on it. So why would you not pay taxes now with the plan that you're gonna be in a higher tax bracket when you retire? Um, and it, it also comes back to retirement planning. Uh, when I'm, when I'm uh, helping someone plan for retirement and they have all pre-tax dollars, that means any retirement income is gonna be taxed. If they have a big expenditure, 
or um, let's say they're living large and they're on vacation in the Cayman Islands and they take a sailing uh, class and they're like, oh my God, I want to be a sailor. I need a sailboat. Hey, Ryan, I need a sailboat. Okay, we're going to have to take out $150,000 to cover your, your $100,000 sailboat because we're going to pay $50,000 in taxes because it's all coming out of pre-tax accounts. But if you have some post-tax accounts, some Roth IRAs, hey, Ryan, I need a hundred grand. No problem. Here it comes. Right. It's just, and so it's, it's, it's different, different tools for different, different jobs, but none of us know what retirement is going to bring. So I usually encourage folks to have a little bit of both. (sighs) Hey, Ryan, I need a hundred (laughs) thousand (laughs) dollars. Really, really good questions, friends. Um, We have about five minutes before we have to wind down if there's anything burning. Um, I also know we've covered quite a bit of information and sometimes I'm like, all right, let's let it digest now. So if that's the case, that's fantastic too. Um, I wanna say thank you again, but I know I've said thank you a number of times and right as soon as I say it, we'll jump back into questions. but I think I'm for real going to say thank you. Have a most wonderful night. Um, We'll end with this question. How about that? Average return on a Roth and can you choose the company 401k? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Average return on Roth depends on how you invest it. So I usually encourage people to invest their Roth very aggressively because the more money that you make in there, the more tax-free money you have available. Um, so it makes sense to have your Roth be very aggressive if you're comfortable with that much risk. Um, and yes, you can choose the investments like the company 401k. That now, typically, the company 401k has um, a, a, a relatively small pool of investment options. Your Roth is likely going to have a lot more investment options. Costs and benefits are relative to the individual making the decisions. Thank you. Thank you. What a question to end on. I hope you all have a wonderful night. If you want to join us, our last um, part of the Young Alumni Series will happen November 9th. It is unwrapping a low stress holiday. So thinking about holiday budgeting and how we set ourselves up for success at the end of the year. Um, But have a wonderful night and go Rams. Woo. Thanks, everybody.